So this morning's lesson is unpolluted number four. And we're going to talk about speaking truth to our culture. Speaking truth to our culture. In James chapter one, verse 27, it says religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. That is pretty easy to understand, I think. Don't you? Church, are you awake? Okay, yes, okay. I didn't see you on Facebook or YouTube either. So uh, are you awake? Yeah. So that's easily understood. We, we do these things. But then he says, and to keep oneself unpolluted by the world. Now, how do you do that? Well, you just keep yourself from being unpolluted by the world. That's, that's how you do it. So I thought maybe it might be helpful for us to just sort of think about um, some of these things. The original sin in the Garden of Eden was ultimately wrapped in selfishness. Do you believe that? Genesis chapter 3. What was Satan offering them? And years later, years later, Satan would offer to Jesus, God in bodily form, he would offer to him what also was wrapped in selfishness. You could have all this if you just do this. And Jesus' response every time was, it is written, it is written, and then it is said. And so he stuck with what the Father had already said. In 1 John chapter um, 2, verse 16, John says this, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So what the world has to offer, we could say, is really wrapped in selfishness because the world belongs to the evil one. As John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, we know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Therefore, void of the creator's influence, our culture worships at the altar of self. Self is what the evil one pushes in order to help blind people to God's way. Selfishness, self. Second Corinthians 4, 4, Paul writes, the God, little g, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that, that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. James points to how Satan uses our flesh against us. If you would turn to James chapter one, you're probably already there. James one. James one verses 13 through 15. And so he's pointing out how Satan uses our flesh against us. And, and so here we go. He says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. Each of you is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Our culture either struggles to believe evil is real or just outright refuses to believe it. If you pay attention to what you hear and what you see in our culture, you'll notice, you'll notice the culture is blind. It has a blind eye to evil. And in contrasting our new life in Christ with 
a life without Christ. Paul reveals in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, that, that the, the world is driven by a continual lust or greed for more. Well, that's what greedy is, right? You just want more and more and more. So our, our culture is, is uh, driven. Our world is driven by a continual lust or lust for more or greed for more. A life wrapped in selfishness was happening in the Apostle Paul's day. He knew that. It was happening in, uh, during the lifetime of Jesus. He knew that. And it continues today. It surely does. We, however, are told to deny self, Luke 9. To put others above ourselves, Philippians chapter 2. We're told to be submissive, Ephesians chapter 5. So as, as Christians, we must never lose the ability to recognize sin. But how do we address sin in our culture? What do we say? How do we say it? Have you ever wondered that? Well, I've seen people shouting on street corners. Maybe you have too. I've seen and heard people yelling at other people. It seems to work quite well, doesn't it? No. I've never seen it. someone say on the receiving end of that, you know what, you've convinced me. I think I, yeah, I, I see the way now. It's Jesus. But I've seen the veins popping in the neck, people pounding, and I've heard people say, turn or burn, you know, as if it was uh, Jonah going through the city of Nineveh. You know. How is sin... Or how sin is handled after our recognition of it shows whether we are representing Jesus or not. So to recognize sin in fellow Christians is useful in the restorative process, bringing them back to where they should be because we understand sin separates us from God. And as we continue in that, this is why John says in 1 John that if we sin, we confess it, Right? How, how long should we let it go? We shouldn't. Once we realize we've sinned, we should confess it. And so we move on. We, we go along with God in Christ Jesus in that way. But to recognize sin in a fellow Christian, that's pretty useful to be able to do that in this restorative process. Now that's looked at by Paul in Galatians chapter 6. You know, you are spiritual. Restore such a one. If someone, if a brother or sister is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, well, what does spiritual mean? Well, he just explains that, the fruit of the Spirit, what that is. It's a dangerous thing when we're not interested in the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And then we turn and we try to help someone get out of a sin. We may make things worse. I said, I don't know. Is that possible? Scripture says, you who are spiritual. That's big. And that's very good. And that should be us. We who are spiritual. Better than other people. We're following Jesus. Who is better. Lived a better life. Sacrificed himself. For us. And so we point people to him. To recognize sin in our culture is to recognize what separates people from God. Right? Have you ever watched TV or heard something or read something or seen something with your eyes about our culture and respond at all? They, they don't know God at all. You say, I don't know if that's the the stance we should take. And then I recall, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so we should think, God loves these people. Regardless of whether we have issues or not, 
God does love. And that's a good thing. He loved us while we were yet sinners, right? Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't wait for us to all be cleaned up and be real nice and presentable and sinless. You can't be sinless without Jesus, you see. So there's no fellowship of sin with God. He doesn't fellowship sin. He does not. Therefore, as we approach our culture in its sinfulness, we must realize that we're at the beginning of the process of sin recognition. There it is. We can see it. And this gives us an opportunity to speak about the restorative power of our father through his son, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? It's highly unlikely that heated rhetoric helps our culture conclude that Jesus is their sin bearer. I have to admit, sin upsets me. Probably at one point in my life, your sin upset me worse than my sin did, right? Well, that was a long, long time ago before I was informed by Scripture. And the closer I get to Christ, the closer I get to God, you know, God does say, draw near to me. And what will he do? He draws near to us. That's true. And as you work on being closer and closer to him. You will despise your sin more than you ever did. And one little sin, little sin. Eh, that's the way we think sometimes, right? One sin may upset you today far more than 50 sins did 20 years ago. Why? Because you're growing closer to God. <clears throat> Austin, would you go in that room and give me a water? I'm sorry. <clears throat> I should have thought about this beforehand. So it's highly unlikely that heated rhetoric helps our culture to conclude that Christ is their sin bearer. Can you think of any examples? I put my mind to this. Can you think of any examples where Jesus yelled at his culture? When he just turned. <coughs> well, he didn't turn a cough, but he where he turned and just laid waste to the culture. Think about that. I can think of examples where. Well, one example where Jesus turned and looked at the city of Jerusalem, the, the city that would kill him. And that's where he was headed. <laughs> and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you together as a hen would gather her chicks. But you were not willing. You're not willing. <clears throat> but what I'm getting ready to do now, this isn't scripture, but what I'm getting ready to do is is offer you salvation through my body, through my sacrifice. I can think of how he prayed for the city of Jerusalem, the very city that would reject him and help kill him. We all have sinned. It's in the Old Testament telling us that and in the New telling us that. So we have all sinned. So you may think, well, who am I? Who am I to say something to someone else? <clears throat> well, think about this. Who was the Apostle Paul? Well, when he was Saul, did he have anything to do with the murdering of Christians? The persecuting of Jesus? Well, he was just persecuting the followers. But Jesus would tell him on the road. Oh, you're persecuting me. That man had every excuse. And he lays it out in scripture. The things he could have used, but didn't. Who am I? Well, I'm a sinner. That by the grace of God found Jesus. And by the grace of God, I'm including people like my grandmother and my mother. 
that taught me about him and took me to a place where people loved Jesus. As if they don't exist. And for reference, those of you that are that are taking notes or that will view this later. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse nine and following and Galatians chapter one, verse verse 13 and following. So. Turning and addressing our cultural, uh, our cultural sin as if we are somehow exempt from sin isn't factual. It's actually akin to lying. For me to turn and say, I don't know anything about sin. If I turn to my culture and say, I don't know anything about sin. You, however, are the worst people I have ever seen. You know, you do all these things. Then we find the Apostle Paul going, well, the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. The th you know, who can rescue me from this, but well, Jesus can. That's what he says in Romans. Jesus. So it's very appropriate to recognize sin in ourselves, in our culture, and then talk about how we've been rescued from all of it by Jesus. Does that make sense? Evil's always looking for a new way to spread its wings. Always. Even though there's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1, 9. Even though there's nothing new under the sun, there are new twists and subtleties to be discovered as we find out. Or they're susceptible to the evil one. You know, Jesus did pray for his disciples and I believe you praying for us, for the father to protect them from the evil one. That's what they really needed. And it's what we need today. <clears throat> It'll always come back to these three basic things. <clears throat> well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Lust of the flesh or desire of the flesh. And this is from John, first John, chapter two, verses 16 and 17. It will always come back to these basic things. Lust or desire of the flesh. What my body wants. The lust or desire of the eyes. What my eyes see and what my eyes think this will be good for you. And the pride of life. Jesus experienced all that Satan has to work with in Luke four when he was tempted. But Satan, he would wait for another opportunity afforded by the flesh. That's Luke chapter four, verse 13. He was going to come back to Jesus. Jesus didn't take the bait. Was he tempted? Well, scriptures, he was, he was tempted. So being tempted isn't the sin. But what we do with that temptation, that leads us, as James would talk about, leads us into that downward spiral. James points to that downward spiral, that succumbing 
to any one of the aforementioned lusts or desires makes that possible. It makes it possible. James chapter one, verses 13 through 15. So in light of all this, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Titus chapter three, verses three through eight. Paul writes at one time, you too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Titus chapter three, verses three through eight. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth by the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Maybe this morning you're thinking about having your sins washed away as as Saul did, who would become the Apostle Paul. And Ananias says to him, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Only God can do that through the blood of Jesus. And we're buried with him. We're buried with Christ and raised with Christ. And God forgives us of our sins. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You're given his spirit. This is why Paul would say, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, a brother or sister that's caught in a sin. Because you have the spirit of Christ. And you're allowing the spirit of Christ to take root. And you're allowing things to grow in you like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the fruit of the spirit, you see. Whom he poured out on on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Since the sin in the Garden of Eden, it's from that time, it's been mankind's worst day because of sin. But, but there was a message of hope in the apostle Jesus Christ, Hebrews 3, 1. Jesus is coming. The Father is sending the Son. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor Slanderers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Can God change people? If people will allow him? Absolutely. And that is what some of you were. Who's he talking to? The church of Corinth. She sure had her problems, right? <laughs> The church of Corinth did. He writes a lot about that. And we're blessed by that so that we don't repeat those kinds of mistakes. It's sort of history, you know. Pay attention to it so you don't repeat those things. Then he goes on to say, but you were washed. Again, are you thinking about being in Christ this morning? If you are, at the end of this lesson, there'll be an opportunity. There's always an opportunity as long as you draw breath to be in the Lord. If you would step to the front, if that's what you're thinking this morning, you want to be in Christ, there'll be a shepherd at the front and he'll greet you and ask you why you've come and you let him know. I want to be baptized into Christ. I want my sins washed away. Repenting of your sins, he'll ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son? You'll answer yes. 
We will baptize you into Christ and you begin your life with him. But you were washed. You were sanctified, set apart. You'll be set apart. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Without watering anything down, we speak truth and we speak it in love to our culture. That's what we want to do. Now, I've listed five things that may help us in this. And you could spend a lot of time with each one of these. And trust me, each one of these is a sermon. And each sub point is a sermon of its own. We could be here literally all day, but we won't be. Number one, follow Jesus closely. You say, I'm already following Jesus closely. I found I can always follow him closer. I keep asking uh, myself or saying this to myself uh, with certain thoughts that might pop in my head. When I'm engaging culture and say, well, Jesus won't let me get away with this, <laughs> this type of thinking, this type of behavior. I can't turn and be this way because I'm trying to be like Jesus. Follow Jesus closely. Learn to be selfless. Learn to be selfless. Number three, learn to view unbelievers through the eyes of Jesus. Hmm. Jesus got in trouble for eating with tax collectors and sinners, right? How did he view them? He viewed them as people that needed help. They needed to see. And there are lots of examples of Jesus, and how he treated Unbelievers, how he treated sinners. Number four, be honest about sin. Just be honest about it. Number five, be honest about Jesus in your life. So those are the five things. And since the original sin, mankind's wallowing in sin and its consequences that have really marked the day. That is until the apostle of our salvation appeared. To become the greatest sacrifice of all time. That's Jesus. Now our best days are realized because of him. It's no longer like it was before. Can you imagine how Adam felt? How Eve felt? Two humans on the planet and they can't even behave correctly. Hmm. And now there are more than just two. And we look at our culture and say, my, my, my. Every generation looks at the culture. Those that are in Christ look at the culture and say, my, my, my. Hmm. Grace is here through Jesus. Now our best days can be realized. And it starts with faith and is solidified in baptism. And then we continue that faith until the day the faith becomes sight for us. No more wallowing in a pit from which we cannot escape. For now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Paul would say. Grace is here and we are safe because of Jesus. So. Go be like him to a world that cannot tell its right hand from its left. Jonah chapter four, verse 11. Go be good. Be good. Be like Jesus to the people around you. Why? Because they need him desperately. And so do we. And so let's cling to him and let's offer him as we hold out the word of truth to our culture. The world that surrounds us that desperately needs him. If you need Christ this morning, why don't you come as we stand and sing?